evening. Welcome to the 34th edition of Schools Out. And tonight we have Sam Jacob. But first, a few words about where you are. I'm sure most of you know. We, you're at the Independent School for the City, a school for people who've already been to school. Um, there's a, a, one of the... You can see the school in action today, or the, or the debris of its actions. Uh, we, we are, with Sam, we are doing a workshop called Crude Hints. It's what we call a speculative archaeology. We are, we are researching a site in Rotterdam, as if, uh, and, we are, and we are searching, we're searching for clues of a possible uh, civilization that might have lived there. And the results of that you can see on the table and on the on, on the uh, on the sockle there. You can see the the, the archaeological uh, remnants and the, and artifacts that we found and the, some pictures. So take a look at that after the talk. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to the party that the school is giving, the yearly party on the 23rd of June, with as, a, with, a, with as a theme, it's hot in the city. Um, so you, you can all buy tickets for that, and we'd love to see you there. And now for uh, the main event of tonight, Sam Jacob. Now, Sa it's, this is, I think Sam is the first person uh, here in the school who's given two schools out lectures. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. Uh, so th these are the statistics. Um, Sam is, a, is an old friend, not just of the school, but also of Crimson historians and urbanists. Um, we work together on a, on a, on a park and a, and a huge villa building in, in Hoogvliet in Rotterdam. But we've also worked together on, uh, on exhibitions in, in Venice. We, and, we, and we're also great friends with, uh, together. Sam is... Um, is used to be a professor in, Chica in the University of Chicago, and now he is just starting out as a professor at the Academy for Applied Arts in Vienna. Apart from that, he also has his own uh, his own uh, practice, Sam Jacob. Uh, what, what is the name of the practice, Sam Jacob? Studio. Sam Jacob Studio. So take. Yeah, just call it Sam Jacob. Uh, it's www.samjacob.com. I think that's that's what it is. Take a look at his work there. But he is he he himself is the best place to give an introduction to his work tonight. Uh, it'll most of it will be recent work and uh, most of it will be unknown to most of us. So uh, I wish you a great evening with Sam. Sam, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, this is all new material, which I know usually everyone's like, oh, boo, boo, I don't want to hear stuff off your new album. I want to hear the classics, the villa, for example. No, uh, no, no whoops from the crowd for that, but... Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, um, yeah, uh, what I'm going to talk about today and maybe sometimes directly, sometimes you might have to infer it, is a kind of a, a, an idea or attitude uh, uh, which may be summed up by this term, hysterical realism. Now, hysterical realism is a pejorative term uh, that was coined by the American critic James Wood about literature. And he was talking quite a lot about Zadie Smith like white teeth era, so this is like early 2000s, but also kind of American authors, uh, Don DeLillo, for, ex for example. And what he was talking about was he thought this was not really literature. He thought there was something wrong with it, that it wasn't really the novel form as the novel form should be. He said, uh, it, it, he, said he ref it referred to novels that he found absurdly elaborate in their use of characters and plots. Um, he thought it was a, a genre of literature that he claimed tried to tell readers how the world works rather than somebody 
than how somebody felt about something. So I suppose, you know, it's a question about like, what is the novel? Like, is the novel in its sort of classic form a kind of a novel a, 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 about interiority of character? Um, and I think this set of authors didn't think about that. They thought about the possibility of fiction in another way. He said that he thought um, these were novels that turned fiction into social theory, as if that was a bad thing. Um, so he would say, so White Teeth, he described, for example, as being big and ambitious in a way that is detrimental to the overall effect of the book, because he was looking for a particular kind of effect. He thought that novels should be talking about a certain kind of thing, should have a certain kind of effect on the author. He thought elaborate prose and descriptions of real life events, so sort of combination of things which are gritty and real, but in an elaborated, over the top way, overheated realism. It's another term he'd used. But I think it's useful maybe to think about it in design terms. Because um, of course fiction's made up. You know, it's somebody writes it, it exists as a book, you read it, whatever. But architecture, design, and cities are real life. But of course, they also contain fictions. And this is partly what this workshop's about. We're trying to use fiction or a fictional idea in order to interrogate the real realities of a, an abandoned bit of wasteland, looking at old condoms and bones of chickens and various other things that we've managed to find. Um, all of those histories, events, characters which have shaped the world which we inhabit are kind of still present in some way, in ghostly form, or sort of ghosts and absolute solidity. So it's that kind of weird combination of the, of the fictitious and the absolutely real, which I think this is really about. Um, so we can understand the world as a kind of fiction made real. So real that we never really think of it as a, as a fiction, but it's like that whole set of abstract ideas about what society should be like, how we should be, what we are as individuals, what is family, what is work, all of those kinds of abstract ideas made into you know, concrete social form that is, becomes very difficult to evade. Um, so in that sense, I suppose, a lot of the work that I'm gonna show has many of the qualities uh, that James Wood described uh, of of, of the books that he had in, in his uh, sites. It's hysterical, it's overblown, but it's also often rooted in a very real circumstance. So it's sort of like going in two directions exactly the same time. And in some ways, I think that's a kind of extreme version of what all design, all architecture is, like hyper-real and hyper-fictional simultaneously. Okay, let me show you something. Oh, so this is uh, actually a Don DeLillo novel. Uh, uh, it, and this uh, uh, thing, the most photographed barn in America, is a passage in the amazing novel, White Noise. Um, and I'll just read you this passage about the most photographed barn in America. So he, he writes, we drove 22 miles into the country around Farmington. There were meadows and apple orchards. White fences trailed through the rolling fields. Soon the signs started appearing, the most photographed barn in America. We counted five signs before we reached the site. There were 40 cars and a tour bus in the makeshift lot. So he's being real here, like he's talking about the real facts of cars and parking spaces and et cetera, et cetera. He carries on. We walked along a cow path to the slightly elevated spot set aside for viewing and photographing. All the people had cameras. Some had tripods, telephoto lenses, filter kits. A man in a 
in a booth sold postcards and slides, pictures of the barn taken from the elevated spot. We stood near a grove of trees and watched the photographers. Murray, that's one of the characters, Murray maintained a prolonged silence, occasionally scrawling some notes in a little book. No one sees the barn, he says finally. A long silence followed. Once you've seen the signs about the barn, it becomes impossible to see the barn. So you can see what, what Old Woods is talking about. Like the character is sort of performing a kind of, I don't know, like a sort of cultural analysis of the situation rather than being a pretend real person with real feelings and real ideas. So it's a kind of, yeah, a construct of the, of the author. Anyway, um, once you've seen the signs around, about the barn, it becomes impossible to see the barn. He fell silent once more. People with cameras left the elevated site, replaced by others. We're not here to capture an image. We're here to maintain one. Every photograph reinforces the aura. Can you feel it, Jack? An accumulation of nameless energies. There was an extended silence. The man in the booth sold postcards and slides. Being here is a kind of spiritual surrender. We see only what the others see the thousands who are here in the past, those who will come in the future. We've agreed to be part of a collective perception. It literally colors our vision. A religious experience in a way, like all tourism. Social comment, close brackets. Another silence ensued. ensued. They are taking pictures of taking pictures, he said. Anyway, I would love to go to see the most photographed barn in America, which is a real place. In fact, is this place, the Molten Barn in, in, um, in uh, um, uh, Wyoming, near to, um, uh, uh, Jackson Springs, Jackson Heights, somewhere, somewhere like that. Anyway, Jackson Hole, yeah, that's it. Correct, thank you. Anyway, you can see, beautiful, you can see the Rockies, is it the Rockies, in the background? You can see the barn itself, which is nothing special. I mean, it's special, but it's special because it's like typologically just a barn, right? And these are all photos which I downloaded off the internet. Very low res, sometimes really good, sometimes really shit, sometimes out of focus. <laughs> um, so I found about, I don't know, 300, 350 of them or something like that. Um, you can see they're mainly, take, mainly, not all, taken from the same spot. And I took those photographs and put them into photogrammetry software, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know, is software which can take 2D photographs and kind of calculates three-dimensional models from that. So you can, we've been using it in, well, we've been using apps which use that same technology in our little workshop where we can take our phones and scan it round and it produces a 3D model which you can then do something with. So this is the this is the the photos going into the program where it starts to the, the, the software starts to pick up like recognizable points and it then like extrapolates from that where that photograph was taken. And so this is a sort of process photo. So these are all the different photos and it's calculating where they are all in relationship to each other. And then you can see it kind of trying to piece together from that information uh, what, it's what the software is designed to do, which is to make a proper, reasonable 3D model, which is a version of the real world. But of course, with the most photographed barn in America, we only have a partial record with the photos off the internet because I wasn't there, because they're all taken or mostly taken from the same place. So there's a real kind of privilege to a certain point of view. And this, these were the first efforts of what, what a mo if so. If this text is taken, they're, these are uh, they're taking pi pictures of taking pictures. This is not a model of the most photographed barn in America, it's a model of the photographs of the most photographed barn in America. So a barn, real vernacular bit of the Old West, sort of 
mediated through tourism and I suppose the ways in which machines look at pictures. Cool, right? Cooler, cooler, like dissolving barn, partial barn. I don't know, like in the same, like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not quite sure what's building, what's landscape, what's mountain. They get a bit higher res, but they're always pretty fucked up. Like, this is not a model, very good model of a barn. So, uh, where's the hysteria in this one? It's hysterical because it's so crappy, right? Because it's because it's falling apart, because it's incomplete, because it's trying so hard. These are the texture maps of all the things that it's trying to paste over the over the over the model. Also, kind of beautiful in their own way. And this this was a 3D print of. Uh, one one instance of the most photographed barn in America, um, but it, it, in a sense, this is a com completely different project about maybe media and architecture and digital culture. Uh, it's about relationships, images, and how our relationships, images changes our relationship to the world. And so this sort of I don't know, like horrific dissolving or exploding thing, which is part base vernacular and part weird technology is the kind of uh, a kind of artifact i think within you know between those those elements between architecture between tourism between media between internet um, other forms of hysterical-ness is like an hysterical response to place we're still in america but now we're in a place called Columbus, Indiana. Uh, Columbus uh, is, a fam is famous in, in the world of architecture from in the mid-century, mid 20th century. It, uh, um, it uh, started to build an incredible array of projects by amazing architects, but this, for this very small town. Um, and there was a, a, a there's an engine company there, Cummings, which is a kind of global engine coming uh, company. Uh, the family also started ba a bank, and they became incredibly wealthy. But they wanted to put something back into Columbus, so they said, "Okay, um, city, if you hire anyone off this list of architects, which I'm going to give you, we will pay their fees." So the city said, "Yeah, sure, okay." So you end up with a Saarinen. Um, uh, uh, church opposite this is an iron pie, uh, iron pie library, which has got like little kids just walking around in it. This is famous Venturi fire station, uh, Henry Moore's lying around. So you're in the middle of the Midwest, and unexpectedly you have in this incredible array of like kind of high culture, but high culture performing really everyday tasks. It's it's an amazing, it's an amazing place. They have a beautiful house built, designed by Saarinen, with textiles by Alexander Giraud. Um, but it's, you know, small town America at the same time. Uh, so this project was had a, a fairly hysterical reaction to that setting. First of all, to the idea that good, in brackets, modern architecture would improve people morally, which is the sort of aim of the project, or the aim of this family thought that good design will make people better. Uh, by the way, Mike Pence is from Columbus, Indiana, so you make of that what you will. But uh, of course, um, it's, it, it's sort of maybe connected to uh, those European settlements in what was considered to be the new world, uh, which had uh, good moral, if not utopian, ambitions. So it's very, it's quite near to uh, a place called New Harmony, for example, which was first of all a German settlement called Harmony, uh, 
a, a sort of utopian religious settlement, which was then bought by Robert Owen, the uh, uh, Welsh social reformer, uh, who renamed it New Harmony. Uh, and so there was like two attempts to make these kind of utopian settlements. This was a, a dream of a, a Owenite um, community, which was like factory, school, living, all in all in one place. Which that doesn't sound so utop utopian, but I think <laughs> like it certainly it didn't want it. It sound, it, it, it was intended to be much 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 more utopian than my description of it. Um, so. Uh, clearly, uh, yeah, Columbus, Indiana, maybe sits within that tradition of how architecture, urban design, and, des and, and design itself can make people better and can manifest forms of utopia. But, of course, we're in a town named after Columbus in a state, well, in Indiana. So there's complex ideas at work. You could say the imaginative space of, of, of utopia for the Europeans, that new world, that clean slate, was an imaginary world. It wasn't the same for the indigenous population. So utopia or possibility of utopia for some, but colonization, dispossession, disease, death for, for others. So in other words, whose utopia? Um, the project sort of is about those kinds of things. So this is, uh, I think, maybe the second edition of Thomas More's Utopia, which included not only the famous map, but also an alphabet, utopian alphabet. Uh, the Utopia itself was written, as a book, was written as if it was a travelogue, as if it was a voyage I think on a Spanish or Portuguese um, uh, ship going to the new world. So it's in some ways a kind of parody or satire of uh, you know, what was happening at the time, i.e. explorers would be sending back their accounts to the king of Spain or to the king of Portugal. Um, <clears throat> but of course, alongside it being a satire, it is also a book which contains ideas about how we could live together. So the, the, the project uh, 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 for Columbus was a kind of combination of these things, a combination of Thomas More's utopia, uh, kind of, I suppose, American sort of roadside vernacular and small town Midwest, little old Columbus. Sort of thought about these kinds of things, like the the ways in which those European ships carried iconography as well as being devices. Maybe thinking like, oh, hold on a minute. Like, look at the arrangement of sail and flags and, and, and masts with, this is uh, Denise Scott Brown's drawing of the Las Vegas uh, like roadside sign. Maybe there's something about these two vertical, like, uh, kind of uh, sign carriers. The, 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 there's, there's no coincidence that maybe this is something which exists primarily in, in, in the US. And I suppose the project was thinking, like, is there something which inhabits the space between them? It thought about um, the technologies of of colonialization, so ships, but also instruments, devices of measurement, these are chains for measuring land, the ways in which uh, the US was divided up into grids and measured even before it had been encountered by the same people who were measuring it. It thought about different kinds of civicness, like old fashioned European civicness, and North American uh, kind of civic iconography. And then it thought about messages. So these are for all phrases taken from Moore's Utopia, but translated into Utopian alphabet.
I thought about like how different design languages might come together. So traditions of quilts and barn quilts in the US and in the Midwest. But also the kinds of patterns that were made in that kind of 50s and 60s design utopia. These are Alexander Girard uh, 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 sort of textile uh, print patterns. And thought about how, the, how those might come together into banners and flags and sails. And it also thought about the sort of translation of different kinds of symbols. So this is a Henry Moore as a neon. This is the map of Utopia. The Utopia as an island is a skull. If you, look, if you look at it sort of slightly with blurred eyes, you see a skull, which is kind of uh, a kind of weird idea. This is a monster in the, in the edges of the map of Utopia. These are patterns, the shaker, shaker drawings of heaven. So the shakers were, were like an, another set of European emigres wild on a certain type of Christianity, um, so wild that they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow themselves to draw in a representational way, except for the strange visions that came to some of them. And some of those visions were the plan of heaven, which looked a bit like that, if you wanted to, uh, wanted to draw one. Um, Robert Indiana, whose real name wasn't Indiana, but changed his name to Indiana, was from Columbus. This is Robert Indiana's famous love, written in Utopian. And these are, yeah, these are just some of the pieces. Uh, 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 far, from, far from trouble and anxiety. No unequal distribution. Make as little wrong as possible. All upon a level. Ease the miseries of others. And they were all part of these kinds of constructions, which were kind of assemblages of lots of uh, kind of what seemed like relevant, adjacent, unrelated things, which I suppose is where the hysteria lies. So here we have a weather vane with an eye, which is Alexander Girard eye, a telescope, you know, measuring device um, journeys, uh, north, west, east, and south in neon letters. These are the chain links of the, of the British system of measuring land, not the French system, unless you're getting confused. Uh, and that's the, uh, the Big Dipper at the top, which was, of course, a key part of um, a way sailors could navigate across the Atlantic. So it's a kind of uh, weird... Uh, sort of lang a design language which is drawn from all of these different kinds of references, things which may have terrible consequences and things which may have beautiful I ideals. This the outsider, Saarinen Bank, a really beautiful bank. A kind of sail, you can see the skull and Henry Moore as a neon, which is also, like, it's so petty, isn't it? Like, to turn Henry Moore, all of his form, into a neon. So mean. The monster, the skull. And a whole load of other things, the different symbols. This is the shaker symbol, the hand with the heart in it. Uh, messages to his Venturi's fire station, and Alexander Giraud, um, uh, like sun symbol within another symbol of something else. So it's a kind of agglomeration, symbol over symbol, symbol attached to symbol, till it, it's, it becomes almost illegible. And maybe also kind of weird to be walking down in the Midwest and seeing these banners, which look like the kind of banners you might find in a high, in a main, in, on Main Street, but written in this script, which is entirely illegible, unless you had the little sheets which allowed you to translate.
so that's a, that, you know, that's a temporary extreme project which is clearly about something. So in that sense, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's design as comment, I suppose. But not all design is comment. Sometimes it is part of real life. This is a very real life project. It's a very classy project. It's for the for the uh, well. This no, the, no. This one. This one is, is is related. This is um about I suppose hi how his histories and design are uh, are intrinsically entwined. So here we've got some beautiful pages. Absolutely beautiful. This beautiful book called um, uh, the Grammar of Ornament by Owen Jones, sort of, sort of late Victorian era. And so, because of the networks of the British Empire, he kind of gathered together patterns from across the world, across cultures, but also across time. So he had Celtic, Renaissance, but uh, in a sense which was quite radical at the time, also things from Persia and India, things outside the you know, classical Western canon. But still kind of cut through with things we might find problematic pages on primitive tribes, for example. Savage tribes is another one. Um, and something weird about it, like he invented a new way of printing uh, uh, to, to make them, to make it look, kind of look the way that he wanted it to look. And in some senses, the, wherever these patterns come from, whichever period in time or whichever geography or whichever culture, they all begin to look the same. He was talking about a kind of universal language of, of design, something which underlies everything, um, which, again, is maybe something which uh, <clears throat> resonates with ideas in modernism and perhaps feels much more difficult for us to understand now, even though we live in a kind of hyper-globalized world. This was a very short and sweet project about like reinventing that. It was for the Lisbon Triennale in maybe 2019 in a section called, uh, it was about pattern and ornament. And this was called uh, Pattern as Politics. And it was just a little display here. You have Owen Jones plates up here and these are responses by just a range of, on the whole, diasporic-ish uh, artists and designers. So Lubna Chowdhury, um, kind of, make, sort of making new patterns, essentially. So this is a ceramic pattern. Uh, Rax Media Collective with the kind of digitally one. Pablo Bronstein on the right with the kind of ornate uh, panic button. Uh, Rana uh, uh, Begum. So that was, yeah, I mean, it was a sort of simple project about investigating the kind of significances and meanings that patterns may have embedded within them or what they might become. Uh, so I suppose, yeah, like how does the decorative have a significance beyond the visual? Or how is its visual field kind of, uh, how, how is its visual field created through being enmeshed with much wider stories which maybe are not apparent in the way that you look at them? Back at the V&A, Owen Jones worked a lot with the V&A, uh, the big applied arts museum in London, big Victorian edifice. It's even got on the top of it Queen Victoria's imperial crown made in a massive, as a massive stone uh, edifice. But also you can see here like values embedded into the fabric of the building. Um, we've got like William Morris here. Queen Victoria, we have the figures of architecture, knowledge, and inspiration above the door. Um, yeah, who else have we got? Who else would you have heard of? Uh, John Constable. So kind of a, a building which narrates what is considered to be good. But also a museum which was kind of, it was kind of interesting when, it's, when it started because it, it commissioned for its cafe some of the hip young designers of the time, including people like William Morris as the cafe. So you would go in and you would like experience this radical new design. So this is an idea which we feel is like even sometimes a little bit new for, for us is already here in whenever it was 1890 uh, kind of being manifested. 
Uh, this was a project to do some very functional elements. New doors within the great Aston Webb uh, entrance. Um, <clears throat> and some toilets and a ticket desk. Uh, so as this is a, clearly a hysterical response to some very basic functions. So this is simply a little lobby uh, to give you two sets of doors, which would improve its environmental performance and would improve like issues around of conservation of objects, that kind of thing. But it's made up of layers of glass. So the bottom layer is big, thick tubes. The middle layer is medium-sized tubes, and the top layer is like thin, thin tubes. And it was a, 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 just a very simple idea of like, if the museum has a display of glassware, could that be manifested in the more functional uh, aspects of the museum? Yes, it could. <laughs> was the answer. And the same for the ticket desk. And then into the toilets where you would walk into the cubicles and once you think you're alone, you find yourself with a life-size figure on these ceramics which are drawn from the museum ceramics collection. So you would find yourself you know, in, the, in the toilet with someone from across geography, across time, depending on which cubicle you may have gone into. Also on the outside is this guy, Josiah Wedgwood, who's very important, sort of pre v &A, but, you know, the pottery guy, I guess you guys, you guys know Wedgwood, uh, um, but sort of very important in terms of, like, being able to turn design into an incredibly successful uh, kind of commercial product. And here he is holding a pot. Of course, the Vienna has a massive collection of Wedgwood. So we thought, well, let's try to work with Wedgwood. Give it, you know. And so we worked with, with we did work with Wedgwood. This is, this is all of the seconds waste from their production line up in Stoke. We collected it over months and began to smash it up and get it into small particles. Hopefully I can show you a video. Of smashing it up. Good, right? So it was so good. And like the seconds are like that, you know, you, you, to an, to the, the normal person, you wouldn't really know that it was it wasn't good. But obviously, Wedgwood have very high standards. Even now, they're owned by a, uh, a, a, a German multinational. <laughs> they still care. <laughs> um, sorry, oops. So good, I show it twice. Uh, but it um, so we just made terrazzo, terrazzo sheets which line the line the toilets with with this stuff, and it looks so good. It looks like you want to eat it. But I suppose, what was it, why, were we, why did we all smash up some Wedgwood? Well, I suppose it's kind of amusing to break loads of pots in a place where the one thing they're not supposed to do is break pots. Um, I suppose number two was like to find a different way to encounter, you know, the, the material. And I suppose third is thinking about like how can ideas of reuse and waste streams be, th be used in, in imaginative ways to create something which is, I have to tell you, it's really stunning, it's really beautiful. So if you're ever in London, you need to go to the toilet. I, re I recommend it thoroughly. Um, but yeah, so the, even the lining of a, of a wall can have a kind of cultural slash historical slash whatever kind of kind of story attached to it. So in this sense, it's not figure, it's not representational, it's material itself, which begins to gain that hysteria of like, I'm not here just as a material, I'm here as a kind of product of culture and a suggestion of what culture could, be, could become. Extreme, uh, like, this is absolutely the opposite, absolutely, absolutely figural. We're in Battersea Park. And it's me with some school children 
and we're walking around Battersea Park and we're looking at all the things in Battersea Park, sculptures and benches and walls and fences and stuff like that. And they took photos, first of all. <clears throat> and then we, uh, <clears throat> from those photos, we made a load of models. You can see uh, Barbara Hepworth there. I have got, uh, it seems, a problem with um, mid-century British sculpture. Um, uh, so we made a whole set of these little tiny elements, like sort of fragments, I suppose. And then uh, the, the class were working on how to then assemble them. So they were making these kinds of constructions and then drawing, drawing them. So we got a kind of catalog really that they were making out of this kit of parts. There we are, working together. And from this catalog, we ended up sort of make, making them, basically. So it's incredibly simple, like pieces of furniture which are made out of fragments of mainly other pieces of furniture, or other fragments of sculptural objects. This is Barbara Hepworth becomes a, <laughs> becomes a table. Uh, but again, so the, the the, the pro in, the, this, in this case, it's the process of making which becomes, I suppose, like slightly hysterical. I suppose also the idea that, that furniture could or should be something which deserves so much intense thought. When, well, this, you know, this small bit of furniture, I suppose. Um, Some of these projects are kind of about different relationships to history and, and how relationships to history can be kind of aggressive, productive, and sympathetic. This is a series of uh, paintings that were from a show that just finished in London. The show was called Against Nature. It had a number of different elements. I'll show you some of them. So these were all antique prints, so from the 17th century to the late 19th century of all these kinds of things, Neolithic structures, uh, which then had these kind of Bauhausian additions to them, painted on in acrylic. Which in some ways are about nothing to do with the Neolithic at all. We were watching Julian Cope's The Modern Antiquarian today, and even though they were forward-thinking mofos, in his words, I think these are not, nothing to do with actual history. They're, they're maybe to do with things which suggest acts of ritual, like things you need to respond to, even though you might not know what that response is, but also as just simply agglomerations of material and how those compositions might be kind of added to or deleted And alongside those was this, this series, which were paintings onto paintings. So these are all existing, you know, uh, uh, oil paintings bought from eBay with black shapes painted onto them. And the black shapes were all derived from geometries of the frame. So, from example, top left corner to middle, middle to top right corner, and then painted in also paint, well, painted on, but also painted into the painting. So it's a sort of like, almost as if there's a number of different representational strategies occurring at the same time. One which has depth, i.e. this stuff, and one which doesn't, which is the geometry. And yet there's a point where they, they meet, where one disappears and you think, oh, that's further away than this one, even though in some ways they're on the surface of the painting, both literally and kind of uh, kind of conceptually. These are all paintings which in some ways are kind of bastard children of picturesque paintings, I suppose. Even these kind of tropical delights. Huh? Yeah, a very, they are very Bob Ross. Yes, they are indeed. Some more than others. Yeah. And as Bob Ross would say, they're 
There's no mistakes here, only happy little accidents. <laughs> God, if only we could all live. Well, even Bob Ross couldn't live like he did. He was ripped off by his son, right? Yeah. God. So there's just loads, loads, loads of them. Part of the point of these is there's loads of them. So there were 44. You saw how they were shown, like, a sort of racks, like, as if, yeah, there was, like, as if, it could, as if it would never end, and at a certain point I thought I would never stop painting them. But you can probably also, you know, I don't know, pick up certain kind of things, like if you were saying, oh, Sam, yeah, that looks, that's a bit like 2001. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like Super Studio, like that, that, kind of, that kind of thing. So it's sort of, I suppose the subject matter is uh, kind of, has that sort of enigmatic quality. Like it exists everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's the Alps or... Hawaii, there will be a black triangle or a black rectangle or a black square. Um, they're not necessarily paintings of something. Like sometimes you might think, yeah, it could be a data center, it could be a distribution center, but it's not quite that either. They're not quite things. That's a beautiful one, right, that one? That one didn't sell. It's too kitsch for architect's tastes. Uh, sadly, it's brig as well, so if anyone's interested, hold of the gallery. Uh, oh, uh, some other things as well. So, so more Neolithic things. This is um, a bean bag, but it's printed with the texture of, of one of the standing stones at Avebury. Uh, it was stone circle near to, Neolithic stone circle near to Stonehenge. And here is Stonehenge as a, as a neon floating above it. This one's called a perfect zero. It's just the it's actually positioned in the same way that Stonehenge is. So you know Stonehenge, the sun rises on midsummer solstice. It would do the, the same. The same thing would happen if the building wasn't there. But I suppose this one's a this what this one's about like the you know Stonehenge. No, as as we've been talking about, nobody knows who they were or what they was doing there. Spinal tap. Um, and. At, at different points in history, it's been a Roman temple, a Buddhist temple, a Jewish temple. It's been a place for space rock. It's been a place for pretend Victorian druids. It's been a place of national conservation. It's been a place of tragedy. It's been a place of celebration. It's sort of incredibly significant, but with almost no significance of its own. Everything's always projected onto it. Um, that it's the beginning maybe, and the end of, of English history. <laughs> um, this is light and glowing rather than heavy thing which is lit, this light. Oh, so lots of reversals here. Um, and it floats. One of the first records of Stonehenge as a thing in the historical record is that it, uh, Merlin spirited it over from either Ireland or from Wales. So it levitated and flew across. Um, it's also a sign. And neon, of course, is the ultimate material for making signs. Um, some, some of the landscape paintings, they started with this series, which was called Sam Jacob versus Prince Charles, uh, now King Charles. So the, these are C. Well, it's 88, 87. This is, these are scans, not real version. Prince Charles's watercolors. Um, Prince Charles is a keen artist as well as architecture critic. Um, and he loves to paint landscapes. Well, of course he does, because he owns most of it. So when he's painting Scotland, he's painting a kind of in his crappy amateur watercolor <laughs> way. He's painting an idealized view of the landscape, of course. Idealized not only through, let's say, the representational techniques which have been handed down to him, um, but also in what he chooses to include and exclude. So this started off with just a very simple idea. It was like, okay, well, let's paint some other stuff into your paintings. Uh, things, the things which are not included in your book of watercolors. Uh, so the, the black shapes here represent that, the things 
which he chooses not to see in the landscapes that he now fully owns himself. Uh, but I suppose this is also to do with, these are also, by the way, for sale as a set of prints, betsprojects.com. <laughs> uh, but I suppose this is also about ideas, the sort of pol politics and ideologies of landscape. So Versailles, you know, access, king, distance, ownership, etc. Very clear. It's very direct. In some ways, it's, it's part of its beauty is the horror is so clear. That one person, that's it. Whereas in England, it's much more complicated because the English aristocracy fell in love with these kinds of paintings, the picturesque paintings of Claude and Poussin, especially. And they saw these idyllic scenes and loved them so much, took them so seriously that they started to make them themselves. The English always get the wrong end of the stick in terms of visual culture. <laughs> Um, so first of all, they started to make these kinds of things, clawed glasses, sort of smoked little lenses, glass lenses, which you would look in and your landscape would look a bit like one of those paintings because it was like a bit distorted and colours changed, so it's a bit like a... Do you remember when you used to do filters on your Instagram? Remember back in, back in history? <laughs> we don't do that now, we're far too sophisticated. <laughs> but we, you, uh, and, uh, you know, people like um, Capability Brown made absolute vast fortunes, basically taking what had been designed as the formal landscapes, like French or Dutch, you know, geometric landscapes, and, make, and making them into things like this, like curvy things, like moving trees around, so it didn't look like it had a structure. Yeah, turning octagonal lakes into, like, things which look like rivers or the things which look like... Well, you know, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, was like massive business for those guys. Um, it's also true there was, there was no lakes below the Lake District. It's quite north in England. So all a lot of many of the lakes that you see photos of in in England are fake fake lakes, which come from this tradition. So places like uh, Stowe, where the picturesque landscape was kind of began um, with William Kent, somewhere just about here is where the picturesque began. <laughs> behind, the, behind the fake hermit's hut um, were uh, sort of fantasies. And they were to do, I think, with uh, a particular arrangement of power the English aristocracy had, particular relationship with land that they had. So this was a little diagram which was about how a landscape like Stowe could be created. So here's, no, here's the, uh, the assembly of land happens over time. The, the family gets higher and higher socially ranked until you get to this guy, who's the most highly ranked. Then his son, obviously, goes bankrupt gambler <laughs> and it ends up being owned half by a private school one where Richard Branson went to um, and and the National Trust so it becomes half like heritage and half I don't know part of the myth making power structures of, of, of English culture of course there's you know injections of money and where does that come from well at a certain point the aristocracy is no longer able to afford it so you have industrial revolution money coming into it or money from the colonies and um, plantations in the West Indies. So very, very complex map of like genealogy, uh, ec economy, um, all, all of those kinds of structures which allow these beautiful landscapes to exist. And the most, I think the strangest thing about those landscapes is they don't look like anybody's touched them. They look as if it's nature absolutely the opposite of somewhere like Versailles. Now, you could also argue that that is uh, a very, um, uh, it's not just an aesthetic project, it's a way of naturalizing power. So it looks like it's always been there, 
There's no way that you could have a revolution. There's no way you should ever question the aristocracy because the landscape looks like it's always been there, but it's highly artificial. So these like complex networks in the production of landscapes. And this is what happened. This is, this is Repton, who had his famous red book. We would have before and after photos. That's, sorry. That's before, that's after. <laughs> or is it the other way around? Um, uh, so someone, you know, an aristocratic couple like this, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, are sitting here in their finery. There's a ha-ha over here, you know, where the landscape drops. But from inside, it looks like it continues to the horizon. From the outside, it's defense, it's, it's like a big wall defending you from not only cattle, but also the peasants. So the kind of, yeah, I think the, the proposition in both those against nature paintings, and certainly those Prince Charles paintings, was like to interrupt the myth of the picturesque and the idea, especially that exists in the English psyche, of landscape and beauty, which still, even though it exists on biscuit tins, also drives planning policy. So we can't really face real issues about climate, about uh, biodiversity, etc., because we're still in thrall to this perverted idea of what nature is. All of this was made possible by this, enclosure of the common lands, which basically concentrated ownership uh, so from, you know, kind of multiple well, uh, ac access, not necessarily ownership, but access, uh, uh, access from the common people to graze or to grow vegetables or whatever. When early forms of modern agriculture came, they, uh, the aristocrats said, this is, this is no longer economically viable. We need to have much bigger fields in order to make it work. And so acts of parliament, one by one, uh, assembled land into these big estates, which were then later transformed into artificial versions of nature. Of course, there were uh, people who were in resistance to this, this is the diggers who uh, had very different ideas. These were the kinds of people who went off, to, went off to the new world with their utopian ideas because they were being put in jail in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and these are some posters which are going up, some billboard posters going up in London hopefully as we speak, which are similar. So this, make the earth a common treasury, is a simple phrase taken from one of the diggers' uh, manifestos from uh, Gerald Winstanley, was the, was the guy who wrote it, uh, on top of a Claude painting. Of course, what's most important in a picturesque uh, painting is the framing of the view. So here, you, the view is absolutely obliterated with a plea, these are called repeal enclosure, which probably will have happened by the time they get back, et cetera. Um, am I going on too long? Tell me, you can just tell me. <laughs> okay. So more Neolithic things. So what, I don't know what's, what particularly is fascinating about Neolithic things to me, but part of it is you're able to see a different idea of the world. Like, clearly, we also don't understand it. Like, Stonehenge has, you know, these meanings projected onto it. So, so when we go to a place like this, Men Atoll in, um, in West Cornwall, all we can really do is go, wow, that's smaller than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's only, like, about that big. <laughs> it's really tiny. <laughs> but also the folk stories which have been built up around them. So this one is like, I think if you want to get pregnant, you have to go through it backwards seven times. If you're, if you've, if you've got, if you're crippled, you go forward, it f go f it forward three times anyway. So you know, like, all of these stones have different stories. The Avebury one, the stone that it's a, uh, that, that, um, uh, 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 what was it, what do you call it? Beanbag, yeah. The story about the folk story about that one is that it, it's on the road to Swindon, which is a biggest, the biggest town near to Avebury. So it's on a busy road, actually. 
The stone's really close to the, to the road. The folk story is that it crosses the road after midnight. It's massive, big diamond stone. That's why maybe it's good as a portable <laughs> beanbag. Like it finally is nomadic, right? The folk story is real. Um, like, I suppose, yeah, like what you're, what I think what I, what I find fascinating is you're encountering something which you don't really know what it is, but it's clearly a different conception of not only place, but your place in the world. Um, it's also maybe related to these kinds of things like how is landscape useful? What does it do for us? What is landscape as infrastructure? This is David Green of Archigram with his famous, at least to me, log plug. So this is the sort of 19, late 1960s, early 1970s vision of like freedom. Freedom which is pastoral, the log, so this sort of comes from the picturesque, but also has all of this infrastructure in it. So it would allow you to plug your transistor radio into it or whatever. Um, now this is, this is the Swindon stone, this is it here, that hops across the road there. And these are the kinds of networks. This is the network around Avebury, which was drawn in the uh, 18th century, maybe. Like, um, but it's incredible to think of, you know, that, like, we don't, you know, we don't understand what was going on. But you can see so many relationships of artificial hills, different kinds of circles, uh, like the, the natural landscape itself. We can only speculate about it. We were, yeah, as we were watching Julian Cope this afternoon, uh, we don't know what they believed, but they really believed it to make the effort to do all of that kind of stuff. So this is the, this is the Swindon Stone again. That's me photo scanning it. And there's more stones of Avebury. Making a, this is making a uh, 3D scan of, uh, of one of the standing stones at Avebury which was then remade one-to-one -one on Midsummer Boulevard in Milton Keynes, a place I know some of you know probably better than you would like to. <laughs> um, it's a, a, a town designed in the early 1970s. Uh, Midsummer Boulevard runs from the train station to the shopping centre and is aligned so that on Midsummer uh, Equinox, the sun rises, a kind of really amazing combination of the cosmological and the utterly banal, which is somehow really, really beautiful. Also a place where, which mixed up, you know, kind of 70s consumer culture, at, which, which was kind of considered to be like liberating and to some extent utopian, uh, with these kind of ancient myths of landscape and ideas of place and so on. So this is a once this is absolute one to one replica of a sanding stone at Avebury but covered in a custom car spray paint. So when you see it from different angles it changes colour. Two traditions, one object. More, you know, experiments with neolithicism, neon neolithic. This was, uh, this was not so much a stone structure. This was uh, called a, this was called the electric nematon. This is in the deep, deep, dark winter of one of the deep, dark lockdown winters in a square in central London. It's a kind of an abstract grove. So it, in Celtic culture, the grove, tree groves were very important as kind of temple places. So we are told. So they speculate upon. So this was a kind of abstracted version of that, a place to meet when we couldn't meet anywhere. Uh, well, yeah, we couldn't meet anywhere, right? Like indoors, at least. And of course, Neolithic structures. This was uh, Project Fat and uh, Crimson did at the, at the Venice Biennale many years ago now. But it was a, a kind of abstracted pseudo-neolithic, pseudo-modernist uh, mound, uh, which was part of a story called A Clockwork 
Jerusalem, the story of modernism in Britain from William Blake to Stanley Kubrick. Um, other forms of hysterical,ness I think, is a sort of desire to, to stick things together. I think you've seen probably quite a lot of that, whether it's materially, whether it's uh, uh, kind of formally, or whether it's to do with different kinds of languages, whether it's sort of objects, well, sort of um, sculpture, like objects like this, a building that's made up, up of slices of loads and loads of other buildings. Um, or whether it's something else. So this is uh, Thomas Fairchild, who was a gardener um, in the 18th century. And he is famous for this, Fairchild's mule in the middle. And um, he was the first person to understand how it was possible to uh, you know, put two plants together when you splice them together. So he took the sweet William and the pink carnation and he put them together to make this. Of course, that's the kind of plant which can't breed. That's why it's the mule, right? Like it, you, it won't fertilize or whatever the, the right <laughs> language of plants is. Um, but yeah, this is a very early uh, this is yes, yeah, kept in the British Museum, I think. Um, but it's it, it's interesting. It's a project. It's a you know, it's the biology, I suppose, of hybridization in some sense. Um, and it, of course, opened up uh, like uh, bot well, botany and agriculture to all kinds of new experiments. Um, this was an illustration of his garden, which is in a part of East London. You can see like his little hot houses. There you can see the gentleman walking around, people working in the little vegetable plots, the little dog prancing around. Um, and that is on the site uh, of this, where this is exact, this, this is a, a, a project uh, which I'm just now showing you what it was. I showed you what it was, was. This uh, is a very small little, like all fall, falling down building in a, in a part of London near, near to Hoxton. So this project's called the Hoxton Mule. And it's, uh, you can see like it's a bit of a shonky area. This is what it used to be like pre-bombing, pre-slum clearance. And the slum clearances in London were going on up to, almost up to the 70s. Like the, the idea that old Victorian or Georgian houses were unfit for habitation and would, which should be demolished was, was, you know, the same homes which are now worth three or four million pounds. Um, anyway, so th this was a, a kind of, yeah, the historic, historic form of that part of the city. So it was a very strong urban grain, terraces, you know, very typical, typical, typical London. Uh, but by the, uh, by uh, the 60s, this part of London had been almost torn apart from its original form. Um, and it's a project which now has this in it. Um, I'll show you the, so this is the site. There's a big Victorian school here. There's these blocks marching up here, which are like 50s housing blocks, like 10, 12 stories high. This is an old sort of market street. And then there's bits of old terracing, but what was once here, a little pub that was part of a terrace which ran all the way along here. This is the last bit that was standing. You could see the kind of shape that it was, that it was in, like totally falling down because it had lost all of its support, partly. Um, uh, and it existed on a, on a U shape. See this U shape here? So this was nothing to do with the city, its history, uh, the natural form of like, how things have been arranged. This was simply a planner at some point had drawn a finger sticking out from here. This has got more historic stuff here. It became a conservation area, and that's the kind of place you're not really allowed to do things which uh, contradict the uh, local character 
uh, of the, uh, whatever the architecture is. But so it's a very artificial line, which would also become part of the, the sort of road layout. Um, like a really strange thing to do. And so clearly in this design, we thought, well, that's perfect. Let's just use that strange, weird accident of history, that moment of somebody drawing something onto a map, and let's make that real. Also saved us having to think of anything, right? Um, uh, so it, it's a project which has like a bit of that old pub, and then a new bit here, you can see the housing that goes further along. You can see a little sort of landmark on top of it. It's a project which has got a kind of st very strong form, I would say, partly because it's very unusual in London. It's a building which is almost like kind of, well, it's, it's got three and a half elevations, I would say. This, this elevation, is, there's a little alleyway, but it's very unusual to find anything like that in, in sort of the Lon traditional London uh, streetscape. It's a building which kind of, I suppose, like draws together lots and lots of influences. So I think architecturally, maybe you can see some yourselves. Everybody always says, oh, Sam, that's your Melnikov project. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 it's my John Haydock project. No, 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 it's my Toya Ito project. Uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's sort of, it's got a kind of compendium of, you know, things which are kind of high architectural culture. It's built out of brick because it had to be. There was no, that was the only thing the planners were concerned about. Um, but it's also, I think, a project which learns from everything which is around it. So the program is basically a community centre on the ground floor and basement, and then a kind of big apartment on the top. It's owned by the community, community centre. They've been there for like 30 years, and it was their building which was falling down, and they had not been able to find a way to uh, do it up or find, um, anyway, so it's essentially a kind of joint venture between me and, and them, which enables them to stay. It's very important for them to stay kind of exactly there because the work they do is with the estates, which are really close to them. Like if they moved across one of the main roads, it would be in terms of their like sort of constituencies, like almost a different world. So their like extreme locality meant like it was, yeah, it's really important for them to, to, to be in that exact spot. Um, so the project is both like a sort of architectural fantasy, but it's also full of references to stuff that's around it. Um, so these are some of the kind of strange typologies. Because this area is kind of unlike, it doesn't really follow the, follow the rules of normal London, normal London. So this is like, you know, it's, it, this is uh, like retail on the front, like it's like you know, little high street retail. It's got a weird staircase up here. It's got a massive deck and then like uh, apartments that are accessed there. It's, it's kind of great, but it's kind of not, not something you'd see in an architecture book. It's kind of a warped typology. Um, you can see here, this is sort of 30s social housing with kind of very expressive like waste shoots and um, like circulation. Uh, you can see very strange like urban planning decisions like, oh, let's just move this back, I don't, you know, like to make this big area, which will then do absolutely nothing with. Uh, it's got hulks around it. So the, the, the small building, the four, little four story building has this big Victorian hulk on one side, big 50s social housing on the other side. So it's a kind of, it, it's spatially in urban terms, it's kind of all dislocated. Weird things like this super tall, super tiny building in the, which is the caretaker's house in the schoolyard. Sort of forms of blankness, like don't care, don't care, really don't care, like just don't care. It's like massive garden wall as urban feature. So these kinds of you know deck access, different ways of 
relating to the street, different kinds of blankness, uh, uh, how to make sense of a fragmented uh, sort of urban plan were all part of the project. Yeah, even ownership, like nobody, own, nobody, nobody knows who owns that. If you want it, <laughs> you, could, you could have it, I suppose. Um, so you can see, sort of see that in the plan. So you see the U shape with a kind of one slice into it. Um, but this is access into the apartment above, up these stairs, so sort of deck access, walking between walls. You can see a certain kind of blankness to it, a certain kind of layering. So this is your deck coming to this. You can see a fragmentation on the inside of the plan. You see the U shape here turns into an internal U shape for the circulation there. Yeah, you can see the U, you, you come up here in a U, and then you're in another U there. There was very little imagination. Well, I try to use as little as imagination as possible. And then you come up into a, another U. You come up this U, and you're back into this U. This is a model of the big U. See, there's like three, four different U's simultaneously. This is the entrance to the dwelling, so you can see another U there. But its uh, address is 54, so it's a little bit Studio 54 <laughs> simultaneously. <laughs> Hysterical, I would say. This is the journey up through the U, so you're in between two different walls. The height of the wall, because it you know, expresses itself as a giant staircase on the outside, is really high. Also, for insurance purposes, it has to be two meters high above for whatever, etc. Anyway, so the wall starts really high, and as you walk up, it gets lower and lower. But at a certain point, you're just in a, can a brick canyon. But it gets better as you get up, and then you find a lovely front door. But then you find the same sort of edge stepped detail on your inside as you go up on the stairs on the interior. And you find your little jutting out you. So this is like the kind of stuff that happens on the back of London terrace houses where people have ad hoc added things over the years. You're in the upper you, and then, oh, these are the kitchen cupboards handles. <laughs> Which is a site plan. Uh, the brick, which has been kind of curving around everywhere, is now the shower curtain, so it can curve whichever way it likes. And this is the kind of uh, sort of building within a building in the hallway. And then, of course, the dramatic moment where you get to inhabit the curve as a double height space with its sort of Melnikov y sort of Gothic windows. Which, when the curtains are drawn, is a little bit, what's that John Lennon video where he's like white curtains, <laughs> his white suit playing a white piano? A little bit that. <coughs> Probably imagine how I'm like, do -do 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 -do. So th in a sense, like this is where the, so there's a, there's a, you could say there's a lot of dirty realism, not only in its sort of relationship to, to the urban context, uh, in maybe the way that it's detailed, perhaps, maybe certainly in the complexities of trying to do a joint venture between a, someone like me and a small local charity. Um, but at the same time, a kind of, you know, something which sort of transcends that which kind of comes out of it. So I suppose, yeah, and maybe this, a magical point out of non-magical stuff where this curves round with your giant steps and it just slots into that gap. It's, ama it's amazing. The bricklayer, oh my God. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so the sort of combination, I suppose, of absolute fantasy and absolute realism, the overblown prose, the overwritten characters, the things which are there to do, you know, to, to narrate ideas about society 
or about a social situation or to manifest a social situation, um, but written in fairly ordinary terms is maybe what I was trying to think about hysterical uh, um, fiction, hysterical architecture, hysterical urbanism. I think hysterical urbanism sounds good, sounds better. Oh, I just thought I'd end with this piece of extreme hysteria, which is, was the entrance to an exhibition we designed called The Horror Show at a place called Somerset House in London, which is on the embankment, so uh, kind of very near to the ha uh, Houses of Parliament. Um, used to be the gateway uh, from the Thames. You used to sail your barge through this before the embankment was built. So with the graphic designers, uh, Jonathan Barnbrook, we made this hell mouth. So the doorway is transformed into a, a horrific fantasy element, but it's still a door. Um, that is all the slides I put together. Shall I? <laughs> I have got some more, but no, no, no. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for your generosity. Um, I find it interesting how you give an architectural presentation which and, and an architectural critique on itself all wrapped in one, which kind of makes questions or remarks uh, redundant, no? That's the main point. Yeah, that's the main, yeah. But I'm still, I'm going to give people a chance to uh, ask a question. Does someone has a, have a question or a remark or something to get off your chest? I think that's part of the point, is that architecture is a form of critique. Like, that that's, yeah, that's, sorry, I'm answering the question you didn't even ask. <laughs> but, yeah, that it is a form of critique, just as those novels are not just like, I'm telling you a story, they're a form of critique them, themselves, yeah. as well as being a, a thing which can be critiqued. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. But still, there was also some... Not all of it had this overwrittenness, right? Not, not, for example, the, the ones where you put black shapes into the, into, into the buildings, they, they, were, they introduced a kind of nothingness into, uh, into, into a situation. Do you think that is also something that could be an architectural approach, that you, where there is too much detail, you would introduce something that uh, you introduce as black hole to suck up all the, uh, the color and... The, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, for sure, like, the blanking out of all of the, his, the hysteria of the picturesque or the Bob, Bob Rossiness, Bob Rossi picturesque. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, the same, I would, yeah, I would love to do the same kind of thing with the world. <laughs> but in the, in the in the right in the right con, in the right context, but it's it's sort of funny. Yeah, yeah, it would be good. It would be good. Yeah. Did you think about the, the, the opening scene of uh, uh, two thousand one, where the black thing enters yeah. and yeah. Uh, it stands for uh, not knowing? Yeah. That that's yeah. and and here you wipe out everything. We we seem to know. Yeah. And you introduce the complete not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of, yeah. Of course. It's directly that. Yes. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure.